right. Thanks for uh, joining us, everyone, for another ATC public discussion. Today we're doing a little um, presentation that David put together for us, that Dr. Scrabina, Dr. Scrabina to put together for us. A um, little anti-tech 101, just going over some of the uh, basic issues, the core fundamental issues, and um, a little bit of philosophy of technology to um, add on to it. And then a little uh, using COVID as an example to kind of talk through some of those fundamental ideas and principles and such. Um, so the first, uh, uh, David's going to present first uh, um, this PowerPoint. We're going to record that section. And then afterwards, we're going to move into a Q&A section, which will not be recorded. So we'll stop the recording and then move into the Q&A so people can feel free to ask whatever questions they, they want. Um, and yeah, so we'll, that's pretty much the plan. We'll probably be about an hour and a half total, uh, if maybe more, maybe less, depending on the kind of questions people have, if any. Um, and yeah, that's the, so that's the plan. Um, so if that all sounds good, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Dr. Scribina. So I will do the share screen here. Okay. So yeah, we're calling this Anti-Tech 101. It's kind of an overview of some main issues uh, in uh, yeah, technology, critique, philosophy of technology, basically just sort of understanding the phenomenon of modern technology. So I've got a few parts here. We're going to start with what we call technology in the modern world, just to sort of set the context for things. So, yeah, just kind of a quick, quick review, right? What are the basic conditions that we all live in today in modern society? Well, sort of, we all kind of know these things, right? We have pervasive, advanced technology. We're all relatively isolated from nature, spending extensive time in buildings, indoors, in vehicles, so forth. Globally, of course, we have a, a growing human population currently over 8 billion on the way to 10 or 12 billion in worst case. Uh, we have an unsustainable ecological footprint by almost any standard. If we look at uh, national levels or global levels, it's far beyond the capacity, the bio capacity of the planet. Consequently, we're facing multiple environmental risks, uh, including loss of species, uh, soil depletion, deforestation, um, yeah, climate change. I think we know those. Uh, kind of ongoing risk to human health and well-being, both physical and mental. We'll talk a little bit about those as we go. And maybe more fundamentally, kind of this condition of, uh, let's say, damage to human freedom, human dignity, human autonomy. These are all conditions that we live in in advanced technological societies. Um, this is not really new. I mean, we've known about these things for several years, several decades, actually. It's become worse in recent years. Just to sort of give you one, one clue, uh, back in 2015, Oxford University put together a list of global challenges that were faced by humanity. They listed 12 of them, 12 major threats to human existence that could potentially mean the end of humanity. Uh, nine of those 12 were technological factors. So they were climate change or related to, to technology. Climate change, nuclear war, global pandemic, which was kind of nice predicted back in 2015, and then we had one of those. Uh, ecological collapse, economic and social collapse, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, which is in the news in uh, recent uh, times, nanotechnology, and then sort of a generic unforeseen technological consequences. It's kind of striking, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, now deceased but famous physicist, uh, made this comment about that time. He said, most threats to humans come from science and technology. Nobody wants to talk about that. They don't want to admit that. At least uh, Hawking had the courage to uh, state that fact, and that's uh, absolutely true. Uh, that was in 2015. Two years later, <clears throat> in 2017, the World Economic Forum put together a list of key emerging technologies that carried significant risk <clears throat> to humanity. <clears throat> 
under the category of moderate risk included several technological factors, including uh, 3D printing, <clears throat> which included bioprinting, nanomaterials, virtual reality, and al alternate reality, <clears throat> neurotechnologies, including drugs and brain interface, and such things like quantum computing and neural networks. Uh, these have been going on as part of the uh, AI process. Those were moderate risks. Under the category of high risk, they included geoengineering, meaning changing the planet <coughs> to accommodate um, requirements for climate change, probably, presumably. Biotechnologies, including gene manipulation uh, using uh, this CRISPR tool. And then AI and robotics which was a fairly broad category, AI in itself, of course, we're talking about that in recent times. Uh, the robotics included things like self-driving cars, autonomous, robot, uh, autonomous robots, uh, military uses, and so forth. So the bottom line is when we look at the situation globally, we see that all major problems that we face at root are technological problems. And it's things from chemical pollutants to greenhouse gases to overpopulation, <clears throat> destruction of nature, military conflicts, terrorism, and so forth. These are all caused by or enabled by advanced technology. It's ironic because people assume that technology will solve our problems. But if, in fact, technology is the root cause of these problems, that's a whole different situation. If technology is the root cause of our problems and it's not the solution, then we're at the situation, as I stated at the bottom, technology is not the solution, it's the problem. There's a thing called technological optimism. People think technology will solve all the problems facing humanity, but that's uh, not true because the problems are technological. The more technology we have, the more problems we will have, not the more solutions. So if there's an initial conclusion that we can draw from this uh, short uh, analysis, uh, as we say, we need to deeply re-examine the technological system itself and find ways to lessen its influence in the world. And we need to do it soon because we haven't got much time. Part two, <clears throat> so we have basic philosophy of technology, just a few key concepts in that field. Obviously it's a huge area, it could take uh, hours and hours to, to describe, but just some basic ideas. So I wanted to start with four myths, common myths about technology that people seem to believe. First of all, people believe that technology is something neutral Uh, secondly, the technology is under our control. Since we make the technology, they feel like we control the technology. People tend to think technology promotes human well-being because we control it. We design things. We're doing it for our own interests. So therefore, it must promote human well-being. And fourth, people believe that technology can be reformed to mitigate or reduce or eliminate any problems. That's the reform strategy. So these are common views, widely held views, implicitly held by almost everybody, including experts and specialists in the field. Uh, I think all four of those are false. So these are four myths. We'll talk briefly about these. Um, <clears throat> so I think here's the truth. Technology, in fact, is not neutral. The, the neutrality question is this idea that technology is just a tool and that we can use the tool as we like. So we can use it for good things or for bad things. Um, we can use it to help people or harm people. It's just a tool. Anything from a hammer and a, and a, and a, a power saw up to uh, advanced AI and you know nuclear weapons, all those things are just tools. They're just neutral things. They're neither good nor bad. And it's all in how we use it. But when you look at it, uh, and many, many thinkers and philosophers have looked at this question, then they almost uniformly conclude that technology is not neutral. Uh, for one thing, the use is not optional. Uh, many technologies begin as optional things and they become mandatory 
in, an, in a functional sense in our lives. I mean, simple things like automobiles, you know, 100 years ago when, when they were first developing uh, automobiles and nobody had one, it was kind of a cute little entertainment and people, you know, the rich guys bought one and went driving in the countryside on the weekends. And then they became more popular, more pervasive and cheaper and more widespread. And then the cities evolved to, uh, to require them. And now, of course, everybody pretty much functionally has to have a car. Same with computer technology, same with the internet, with email, with cell phones, all those things at one time were optional and now functionally they're not. If you want to exist in modern day society, you have to use those things. Technology introduces many unpredictable consequences. The more complex the technology is, the more we are unable to anticipate what will come from these things. That's, that makes it not a neutral thing. Correspondingly, the risks are unpredictable. Uh, again, as complexity uh, grows, we don't really know what kind of risk we're facing. Are they small risks? Are they recoverable risks? Are they catastrophic risks? We don't really know. And finally, it's not even clear that we have a net gain. We introduce new technologies and devices because we think it's going to help us, because it's going to cause uh, create a, some kind of benefit to our lives or to society. But of course, there's always trade-offs. And the question is, is the trade-off, is the cost worse than the benefit from the, the technology, right? So that's the question of a net gain. And it's far from clear that we have net gain. In many cases, we have a net loss for, for advanced technologies. Second myth, technology, in fact, seems to be not under our control. It's a highly dispersed, diversified global entity. Um, again, take things like artificial intelligence, because that's in the news. Um, you know, lots of different research units are working on it, labs, corporations, universities. Um, military institutions, multiple countries are working on it, private individuals are doing these things, highly dispersed around the planet. No one person or organization can control these things. Uh, obviously, there's uh, in such a condition, there's really no legal or ethical oversight. We can sort of call for things, we can ask for requirements or restraints, but uh, those are purely voluntary. The net effect is we tend to sink to the co lowest common denominator. So the person who's willing to use the most powerful technology the soonest to his advantage tends to come out ahead, which forces other people to respond in kind. And so you're introducing rapid, powerful, risky technologies without proving them out um, because of emergency conditions and competitive pressure is what, what that does is that drives us down to uh, what we would call the lowest common denominator. And of course, there's high incentives uh, all along the way, incentives of profit, power, um, you know, control, uh, manipulation of people, and so forth. Kind of the bottom line, we see this a lot when we talk about uh, advanced technologies. People say things, I like this little phrase, I, I, I ask people to look for this little phrase, this idea that we have no choice. And we see this a lot, of, this is in Ray Kurzweil and other people who talk about uh, technologies. I've seen it recently with the, with, the, with the advanced artificial intelligence. People say, yeah, there's problems. Yeah, there's risks, but you know, we have no choice because of, well, if we don't, you know, if we don't do it, I heard this just Bill Gates the other day. If we don't do it, then the bad guys are gonna do it. And well, we don't want the bad guys doing it. So we have to do it too. And of course, you know, if we don't do it, the Chinese are going to do it. And the Chinese are saying, well, if we don't do it, the Americans are going to do it. And so everybody's kind of pointing at everyone else. And the bottom line is, yep, you got no choice. You have to press ahead. That's a disastrous condition. Third myth, technology does not aid our uh, well-being. In fact, it uh, harms our well-being. In many cases, we have negative physical consequences to our health. Um, cause of illnesses, injuries, uh, military uses, of course. We're seeing, especially in recent years, negative psychological consequences, stress, depression, psychosis. Uh, for people who engaged in intensive technology use at work and at school, especially young people who are doing lots of time online and social media, we see lots of adverse psychological consequences. Uh, and finally, there's negative ethical consequences as well in terms of living under a surveillance state, uh, corruption of individuals and institutions, the general dehumanizing tendency of, of technology. 
all adverse consequences to human well-being. And lastly, on the reform thesis, which everybody says, they say, yeah, sure, these problems, yes, we understand that, but well, we'll just fix the problems, we'll just reform the technology, and then things will go away. But of course, that doesn't seem to really work. Uh, if you look at the history, and I have, the historical evidence suggests that technological reform is at best partial. You can reform or fix a small piece, a small component of the problem, but you never really get to the whole problem. It's often a temporary fix. And in the end, it's often counterproductive, meaning you fix one problem, but you introduce another problem or more problems that are worse than the original problem. So in that sense, it's counter counterproductive. So that's just sort of a very short analysis of those common myths. And I think we can, we can show a good argument why all four of those are not true. And those are the standard defenses that we hear from people, the pro-tech people. And I think we need to be prepared to challenge every one of those because there's, uh, there's data and evidence behind all, all of our uh, uh, counterclaims. Okay. All right. Um, so structure of modern technology, just kind of little brief, little philosophical overview here for those of you who are interested. Um, a lot of this comes from the work of Jacques Ellul, who was a key thinker, key person in their critical uh, analysis of technology. His book, uh, The Technological Society, is an essential work to be, to be read by anybody who has uh, concerns about technological society. It was the basis for Ted Kaczynski's a manifesto, much of his ideas came from Jacques Ellul's Technological Society. Especially chapters one and two are essential readings. Uh, I cover those many times in my courses. Um, but Ellul basically lays out a kind of structure, the main characteristics of modern technology. Just to mention these here in passing, there's lots to be said. Uh, I can't elaborate here, obviously. But Ellul went through five, we'll give five key characteristics of modern technology. One is automatism, meaning that the process is self-directing. Technology seems to direct itself toward its own advancement in a kind of self-defining, self-directing way. We see this even in relatively simple technologies, um, far more the case in advanced technologies. It's remarkable that Alul even um, identified such things. This was back in the 1950s let alone what we're facing today. Uh, he also uh, came, up, came up, uh, upon this characteristic of self-augmentation. So where, where technology is a self-growing or self-building phenomenon, and it grows in kind of a progressive, and let's say kind of a, a ratcheted way, where it's moving head forward. It doesn't move backward, it only moves forward in an irreversible way and in a rapid way, not just sort of linearly, you know, increasing at a sort of a regular linear rate, but at an exponential rate. So rapid exponential growth in technology, all right? And this is what we're seeing, particularly now with AI, we're seeing rapid, forward moving, irreversible and exponential growth. Third characteristic uh, that Alul uh, identified was monism. And he said, well, look, modern technology is basically an integrated holistic phenomenon. The whole system kind of works together. It all, it all, all the parts sort of need each other to play together. It's like a watch where all the, all the components are required to make it work, um, which means you can't just extract one or two bad, bad parts that you don't like. You can't take those out and still have your technological system. It demands all components of the system. You have to have the supply chain, the resource extraction, the processing, the manufacturing, the deployment. All these things are integrated together in a tightly knit way, and it functions as a whole thing. Fourth characteristic was universalism. Uh, again, technology basically expands globally. It looks the same globally. Uh, we have the same basic technologies around the world, the same internet. Uh, same power structures, same in, uh, cell phones, uh, you know, to in, uh, whatever tablets and you know all these uh, automobiles, right? Aircraft. I mean, it's basically the same. The technology uh, expands universally in the same way. This is sort of why even the most 
uh, what in past times would have been far different cultures, Asian cultures or African cultures, once they become modernized, they all look the same. They look like technological societies. And the fifth component is autonomy, independent action, that uh, technology seems to function on its own independently. And it's the driving factor uh, behind society. This has a name, I'll, I'll mention that in the next slide, it's called technological determinism, where technology is an autonomous force in society. It drives the other components of society. It drives the uh, e economic system. It drives politics. It drives uh, social change, social values. Uh, yeah, per pretty much all, all aspects of, uh, of modern society. That's a very brief overview. I would definitely uh, refer you to Elul's book, especially chapter two. He's got a, a tremendous elaboration, lots of good examples of all five of these. So, um, summarize that. Uh, we would say that it appears that the technological system advances independently of human wishes, and it frequently does so counter to our own best interests and counter to the interests of nature. We know this because A, technology is unquestionably advancing. B, human well being is unquestionably declining. Human health and welfare is declining. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. The state of the planet environmentally is not getting better, it's getting worse. But technology is advancing all the time. How is, that, how is that possible? The only explanation is that technology advances counter to our well-being and counter to the well-being of the planet. That's the only explanation. If it was the other way around, our health would be get, get, getting better, we'd be healthier and happier, the planet would be flourishing, but it's not. That's proof. Secondly, technology, as I said, is the key driving force behind political, social, and economic change. Thus, we have a condition uh, in, in philosophy of technology that we would call strong technological determinism. Technology is the primary moving force in society today. It's the primary cause and it's the primary threat. So again, to summarize, technology is the primary cause of social and environmental problems. Therefore, the obvious answer is that any long-term solution has to be a rollback, an extensive rollback, or an elimination of industrial technology. This is the revolutionary thesis. This is precisely Kaczynski's thesis. Um, and the logic drives us there. I think any other position is probably indefensible. Okay, a few more slides. And we'll sort of open it up to a Q&A. Uh, so part three here, why look at the COVID pandemic just as a kind of an interesting little case study. Um, so yeah, COVID is sort of over for now, but of course it's not really over, they say, first of all. Secondly, of course, we know probably the next pandemic is just around the corner. It's out there brewing somewhere in some lab or some, uh, in some uh, you know, remote corner of the jungle that somebody's about to pull into human society and it's about to get unleashed. But just look at any pandemic, forget about COVID, any pandemic requires certain things to happen. One, it requires dense populations. We did not have pandemics in hunter-gatherer days because populations were sparsely uh, dispersed, right? I mean, they, 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 were, they were not dense and any local infections or contaminations were very local and uh, local consequences and that was it. Now, of course, we have very dense populations you have to move the pathogen around. So any pandemic requires relative, this is relative, of course, relatively high speed transportation systems. So today's, of, uh, of course, we have uh, jet airplanes, uh, high speed trains, even automobiles are sufficient to rapidly move pathogens around the planet in a day and within societies easily within a matter of few days or a few weeks. Um, what we also have is a kind of, uh, again, for any pandemic, is a kind of interference with and manipulation of nature. So, for example, we have industrial animal farming, which tends to create new pathogens in, in uh, animal, uh, intensive animal agriculture. 
on the one hand. On the other hand, we are invading wild animal habitats in the jungles, in the tropics, exposing ourselves to new pathogens that maybe were relatively benign in animal populations, and then they get transferred to us and become very, uh, very dangerous. And then of course, now we have, uh, in the present day, we have industrial technological causes of, of pathogens. So for example, we have this nifty little process of genetic manipulation. So here's a little quote by uh, journalist Nicholas Wade. Uh, he said, ever since virologists gained the tools for manipulating a virus's genes, they have argued that they could get ahead of a potential pandemic by exploring how close a given animal virus might be to making a jump to humans. In this process, justified lab experiments in enhancing the ability of dangerous animal virus, viruses to infect people. So we undertook deliberate processes in labs to increase the potency of these uh, indigenous viruses to study them, to learn how they work, right? To manipulate them. There's a name for that. It's called gain of function research. You probably heard about that with the COVID pandemic uh, going on in, uh, in, in China and I'm sure many other places around the world. I'm certainly in the United States. Uh, researchers are doing gain of function. They're enhancing the potency of viruses to study them, to learn how they spread, uh, which is, of course, extremely risky, right? Then on top of that, of course, we have the, all the military uses. So we have bioweapons. So uh, unquestionably, all the major militaries around the world, including US, China, Russia, you know, any major, you know, India, uh, Middle Eastern countries are certainly working on genetic manipulation in terms of bioweapons to create, um, yeah, biocontaminants, biopathogens that are genetically engineered to spread and to attack enemy nations or enemy people. And then uh, one more, of course, we have the old lab accidents. We happen ha happen uh, all the time. If you're working in a lab environment with uh, dangerous and potent pathogens, you know, these things are microscopic, obviously, they can escape. When a lab worker gets contaminated, he leaves the, he's not fully decontaminated, who goes on to society if the thing escapes. Um, yeah, myriad opportunities for uh, laboratory accidents. Another striking thing about COVID was the response, the solutions to the COVID pandemic were always technological solutions. We need more technology, more advanced technology was always the answer to our problems. So for example, how, what did we do? We had to develop a new vaccine. We needed a new high tech vaccine using something new mRNA, messenger RNA. Uh, yeah, we had to invent this or you know, uh, deployed it in a new way uh, to deal with the COVID um, pandemic. We had to do mass experimentation on people, mass, because it was a, a mass phenomenon. So we had to basically experiment with these vaccines with people, old people, sick people, young people, children. Yeah, right. Still don't understand the consequences. For the people that got sick, we had high tech uh, medical solutions ventilators, medical facilities, special, uh, you know, uh, the disinfection units and people wearing their space suits to avoid getting contaminated and so forth. We had nifty little treatments like monoclonal antibodies and other sort of nice little things that got invented to, to, uh, to deal with these things. So that's how you know you're dealing with a technological situation because all the solutions to the technological problem are technological solutions. That's, that's a case study in a technological society. Technology causes the problems and it's supposedly the solution to the problems. So maybe temporarily we've solved the COVID pandemic, but we haven't really done anything fundamental. We haven't really addressed the root cause of the problem, right? So just to sum up the COVID thing, right? We have uh, increasing evidence that suggests that the, the pandemic seemed to have started in the lab. Nobody really wants to talk about that, but that seems to be the case. Uh, quite possibly genetically engineered, might have been a bioweapon deployed, might have been a lab leak. 
We don't know. We do know that all the solutions to the COVID pandemic were always more te technology. Uh, the, the true solution, the getting to the root cause, would be the technological system that allowed the pandemic to exist and spread in the first place. So for example, uh, restricting high-speed transportation, staying out of wilderness areas, marking them off, reducing population levels and densities. Those are the root cause solutions to any pandemic. We didn't even talk about those. Those weren't even on the table. No one discussed them, no one debated them. Those were out of a question. We just introduced our technological solutions. We did not address the root causes, which guarantees that there will be a future pandemic and that it will be worse than the first one. So that's, that was my final point. More tech will lead to more and worse pandemics. Uh, that's virtually guaranteed. Okay. That's really the, uh, the, the, the main part of the presentation. Just the last couple slides here, this part four, sort of what you can do. So just a few things, of course, it's pretty overwhelming. We've got a massive technological system that's run amok and things are rapidly getting worse on multiple fronts. And you know, you can kind of feel powerless and um, sort of just depressed, but there are some things that we, all of us can do. So we jotted down a few things. This is sort of the function of the anti-tech collective. So the first thing is to get well-educated so that you know what's going on. We have a library link at the ATC website, which gives a list of essential reading material. So that's sort of the base, basic thing, first of all, right? Just know what you're talking about, know the history, know the essential pieces, right? The books like Jacques Ellul and obviously Kaczynski's work, and there's lots of other thinkers. I've written a couple of books myself. Uh, just a matter of being well educated of yourself. Then as you do that, you can sort of start to educate other people because you become a knowledgeable individual. You could speak out, you can write, you can do blogs, you can do podcasts. Um, you know, we're always interested in writers here for ATC, um, you know, blogs and just uh, essays or articles and so forth. You can connect with other people in your area. We do lots remotely because we're functioning online here, obviously, but it's nice to work with people face to face, uh, connect to other people in your area, work with them to raise awareness, help other people get educated. One thing to look out for is uh, what I call the fake critics. There are lots of people who claim to be critical of technology. Um, and they're not because they don't really either they don't understand what they're talking about or they're uh, just superficial thinkers or most likely they just are convenient to the system because they don't prevent uh, present any profound challenges so i'm thinking of people like sherry turco and uh, jaron lanier and some of these other people that are paraded in the media as critics or skeptics of technology and they say really nothing of substance. They, they either just don't know what they're talking about or uh, they have no ability to get to root causes. So uh, it's nice to identify those people and, and avoid them or at least, at least criticize them because they're, uh, they're due, due for some good criticism themselves. And of course, helping out our, our group, uh, donations, financial donations, right, written donations and so forth are always helpful. Um, and then even little things like becoming a member Right, we've had processes going on. We're sort of rethinking this process uh, recently, but we've had monthly meetings. We've had a newsletter. Uh, we try to network with people, other similar groups around uh, around the, the world, to try to get this uh, word out globally. So that's our presentation. Thanks for your time.